to next. Uh, today, um, we'll be talking about um, difficult pain. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Mahesh Manon, uh, who has an MD in anesthesiology, <laughs> and uh, he has a <coughs> fellowship in pain management from Singapore. Uh, he also has a, a postgraduate diploma in medical law and ethics uh, from National Law School, Bangalore. Uh, and uh, he is a person who uh, has uh, set up an ESMA accredited uh, integrated oncology and palliative care center um, in uh, Mumbai. Uh, and he's the first one to receive um, European diploma in pain medicine. <coughs> And he has been an active uh, part uh, in training palliative care, pain medicine. Uh, and uh, his, uh, uh, he is also founder of uh, uh, Society for Integrated Pain and Palliative Care. And his areas of uh, special interest are cancer pain, neuropathic pain, and palliative medicine. <clears throat> so uh, welcome, uh, Dr. Mahesh Menon. And it's over to you. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, am I audible? Yeah, you are audible. All right. So I just start by uh, sharing my slides. Is this visible now to everyone? Yes, yes. Yes, thank you. So I'll just uh, have no conflicts of interest to declare. I would like to start my presentation with a thank you slide. And I usually start presentations with a thank you slide. I would like to keep it for the end because that's when the attention is the least. So let me first thank all of you for this opportunity. Uh, we say that when one teaches, two learn, you know. So whenever there are interactive, uh, sessions like these, I definitely get to learn something new. And I hope I can share some uh, information with all of us so that uh, we can help our patients. So today's topic is difficult pain. Uh, I'll just give an introduction. When I came back from Singapore to our hospital as a pain specialist, diff uh, different uh, branches would introduce me in different ways. For example, the security guards would refer to me as the painkiller on the first floor, you know, so that's my office. So they would refer to me as the painkiller. We'd have housekeeping services. They would refer to me as the pain cleaner. And uh, we'd have different references. And sometimes you're introduced as, this is Dr. Mahesh, he's our pain. And they wouldn't even elaborate that it's a pain specialist. So I've come from about a decade before where, you know, introducing the concept of pain management was difficult in the corporate world to topics where we interact with one another and understand this uh, topic. So I'm going to give a brief introduction, something on pain physiology and uh, about uncontrolled pain. And I'll try to add some small stories. So to keep it a little interesting. About more than half a century ago, a surgeon, Mr. Norman Barrett, he told a nurse to go and read medicine. It's the doctors who desert the dying. There's so much to be learned about pain. If you don't do it properly, you will be only frustrated. They won't listen to you. So there's a quote for all of us to see here. Any guesses who this nurse was on the chat box? Any guesses? So this nurse was Dame Cicely Saunders. So Florence, yeah, that's uh, about a half a century ago. So Florence a little before. So Dame Cicely Saunders, when she was told about this, she did learn, yes, the, she learned medicine and you know she set up the St. Christopher's and this was just one of the uh, things that spurred her to go on to work in pain. And then this line, all of me is wrong. Again, 
this line is important for all of us in palliative medicine because these were the words spoken to her by Mrs. Hinson at the St. Joseph's uh, Infirmary where she told her that the pain starts in my back but now it just feels like all of me is wrong and this concept was written in the prescriber's journal in 1964 by Dame Cicely Saunders as the concept of total pain where all the other dimensions of pain were included. This is just to orient the community to the concept of total pain which has been going on for a long time and I'm sure you have had lectures about the basics of pain by stalwarts and you've been taught about this. Now we'll go on to the pain medicine part, pain pathway. So quick, uh, again, I'll wait for the chat box. Any connection uh, the, uh, with these two images on the screen, any connection to the topic on hand today? So we have uh, Timothy Livingston Johnny who's introducing, okay, that's you introducing yourself. Uh, who are these two gentlemen? Any idea? And what's the connection to the image on the screen? That's, of course, uh, chilies. But any connection to the neuropathic pain using capsaicin, Dr. Shravani, capsaicin, capsaicin. Great, great. Helps in pain. Great. So if we are on the right track. So these guys got irritant pain relief, capsaicin. So these two gentlemen, David Julius and Ardem Patapotian, they got the Nobel Prize in 2021 for the TRP V1, the transient receptor potential V1 paneloid receptor. And they developed the mechanoreceptors and the chemoreceptors uh, uh, responsible for pain sensation. So if you look at the pain pathway, like any neurologist, if you start with the periphery, pain travels to different levels of hierarchy before it reaches your brain, where noxiception, which is tissue injury, is translated by very primitive and developed body mechanisms, the neo and the paleospinal thalamic tracts, into what is known as the uh, cerebrum, where we perceive pain. So when we talk to patients and we discuss pain with them, we ask for provocative factors, but I'll just give an example how just using the pain pathway, we can establish the nature of pain. If the pain is spontaneous or it's evoked. And in palliative medicine, we see a lot of patients who have baseline pains and it's evoked like breakthrough pains. Well controlled, but they have breakthrough pains. It could be with movements or it could be with temperature changes. So in this, the language of Neurobiology is clear. If there is spontaneous pain, it's clearly central mechanisms which is causing the pain to uh, light up. If there is an evoked pain with mechanical stimuli, it could be peripheral or central mechanisms. And only thermal, it's usually peripheral sensitization. So I use a word here called sensitization. And this is extremely important video. I want you to pay attention to this video to understand the concept of sensitization, which means that a patient who is in pain for a long time, instead of down-regulating, like you have touch sensation, temperature, where you can, you may, in some sensations, you may down-regulate the sensation. I'll give you a simple example. You say, uh, you you have your glasses on, your, on top of your head and you're like looking for your glasses because the sensation of the glasses is no longer there touching you there, you know, you're used to it. So it's desensitization in the same way. Unfortunately, pain has this peculiar habit of sensitization. And this is given to me by a very reliable university called WhatsApp. So I'm going to try to see if you can understand this. If you have one repeated stimulus, it activates the noxiceptors. There is sensitization. There is a phenomenon called wind up and long-term potentiation. So from the initial stimulus response, you end up getting a signal which is amplified. By the time the patient comes to us, they have gone into a chronic pain state where the pain was initially noxiceptive, but now it takes on neuropathic and noxiceptive characteristics. So how can we treat patients using the pain pathway? So you can go to the periphery, treat them with interventions, treat them with medications. Slightly above, you can go all the way up to the level of the spinal cord, 
and thalamus and uh, do interventions and medications deep brain stimulation all of these at the higher levels and cognitive behavioral therapy again that works at the level of the highest centers but in practice most of what we have is relegated to the periphery most of the work like transcutaneous stimuli we work at the level of the uh, peripheral nociceptor and the spinal cord and the other measures leading to psychosocial interventions cognitive behavioral therapy antidepressants all of these work at slightly higher centers but at the end of the day pain is a thought so modifying pain is as uh, easy or as difficult as modifying the thought process of an individual so this has to be remembered the idea behind this slide is to emphasize on the drug measures and the non drug measures in managing pain so this is very rhetorical question that we are unique like everyone else in 2003 there was an interesting article in neurobiology about how a small little strip of the insula in our cerebral cortex gets inputs from different parts of our body the viscera temperature and pain and all of these are a delta and t and all of these give us a feeling of well being or how we feel so if you want to feel good you should have the least input from these the thermal the pain and the visceral uh, receptors and this is found in higher mammals most of our pain research is done uh, you know we should have a moment of silence for all the rats and uh, rodents in labs where research is done but in primates and higher mammals the insula that gives one the perception of self and well being this is where pain signals also converge so this is just to put it out there as a thought process that everyone is unique and each one of us especially the uh, higher mammals get signals in different ways where we perceive pain in a slightly different way from other organisms now this arrow to your left that i have shown the pain pathway is deliberately gone beyond the cerebrum and this is to show you the dynamics of pain so whenever patients come to us in pain we look at the acute process which is taken place over hours where immediate relief is important it can progress to days to weeks and finally this pain can last for months to years so as a product of time what is the impact of pain on physiology there's an elevated heart rate increased blood pressure sugars are high there's hypertension there are cognitive changes and these things keep happening in fact with passing time there is degenerative uh, there are degenerative changes in the brain which is associated with chronic pain so we look at just the impact on the patient we look at impact on the mind and we look at impact on the family and society and the functioning of the individual and their role in society as social creatures there is a lot of impact that chronic pain and suffering may have on an individual the final uh, part of the talk is a couple of stories with difficult pains about 100 years ago we had uh, an article on uncontrolled pain about the suffering of patients from malignant disease and uh, using increased amounts of morphine so they would use alcohol cocaine a lot of things to alleviate pain in those days and the first few articles on intractable pain dealt uh, not with pharmacological measures but with aggressive surgical procedures like cordotomies or neuroablative procedures and they were very aggressive however very rare so if you look at the history of intractable pain states there has been a lot of research over the last century in dealing with this however the essence of the topic that intractable pain can affect the patient and the, uh, the the patient and the human being as a person that started coming in the latter part of uh, the uh, of the last century and we started getting a lot more work done in the mind and body connection and the concept of personhood and today we have a more comprehensive way of dealing with patients who come to us with difficult pain states just an orientation you all all of you know the definition of pain by the international association for the study of pain you give medications fortunately pain is under control that's controlled pain 
however you give medications you're not able to control it it becomes uncontrolled pain and in all of these you will have baseline pains and episodic pains and in between you will have breakthrough pains on a background of well controlled pain so these are different terms that you will know and you will also read about noxiceptive versus neuropathic and then there are different categories the more you uh, read up about the definitions the purpose of these definitions is to have some uniformity in pain research so that when we con communicate with each other as scientists we can use the correct terms there's another definition for pain which over the last 15 to 20 years of my experience i'd share with all of you if it bothers the pain it's discomfort bothers the patient let me uh, i'll correct myself the bothers the patient this pain is called a discomfort if it starts bothering the caregiver it's problematic it bothers the doctors and the nurses this is troublesome pain and once this issue is elevated to hospital administration and the powers that be and there is pressure that is genuine pain so in real world practice the level of pain actually is uh, determined by how much you are bothered by it because pain is very easy to bear as long as it is not your own so when you have patients who come with severe levels of pain you will still see that they have been to multiple specialties but the pain hasn't been addressed because it's only at a discomfort problematic bothersome level this was of course in jest i'll come to the story that we are sharing about 12 14 years ago we had a patient who came to us with uh, severe pain and uh, he was a farmer he had a recurrence of an oral malignancy and the pain was intense and spontaneous it was worsening at night and it was affecting the sleep and oral intake so much so that he told his son that just give me rat poison because morphine doesn't work and amitriptyline doesn't work i'm not even able to sleep diclofenac it was not relieved by medications so he said just kill me i've, I've had enough so this request for dying because of intense pain is something that is seen in palliative medicine we encounter these scenarios also so at that time um this is of course the uh, gentleman and he wasn't able to eat anything he hadn't had food so this is of course not his video it's a video that i had about 10 years ago so this is what we had done for him we had given an ultrasound guided injection that you see is the carotid just behind it is the chasagnax tubercle medial to it where the needle tip is going that's where our uh, uh longus coli and the stellate ganglion is and i have injected that area nowadays we use the lateral approach this was through the thyroid the end point of course uh of all of this was is the first time the first meal that he had you know we had a, i had a couple of biscuits and you know so i said you can try eating this see if you have pain and he was able to eat this i had a video of this unfortunately i don't have it right now with me but he ate this and he was very comfortable so sometimes head face neck pains a rich innervation by the trigeminal can be difficult uh, to treat another patient uh, this is 10 years later he comes to us in the hospital numbness and severe right sided facial pain after a surgery for buccal mucosal cancer after about 6 to 8 weeks of uh, the surgery no one is able to figure out why what's happening and very soon they they start doing scans and maybe about a couple of months later an mri with contrast showed that there was a recurrence and this was along the mandibular div division and with slight intracranial extension so the first thing of course that we tried were medications and that was carbamazepine pregabalin gabapentin tramadol tapentadol nortriptyline to of course not all of them together we tried maximum doses for most of these morphine 180 mg per day and diclofenac he even went through underwent radiotherapy and the oncologist felt that by giving chemotherapy maybe that will help him with uh, the pain state there was no change with in the pain so this is what we did for this patient we uh, again not a same patient the representative picture we did a percutaneous trigeminal ganglion ablation we ablated the trigeminal ganglion and ablated this nerve and desensitized it so that he was pain free for a long time and this one year is the last follow up which is few years ago and he continues to be pain free but i'm not i haven't had follow up with him after that patients may come to us with generalized pains they have pain all over the body uh, severe intractable pains difficult to manage 
we can start them on intravenous infusions like ketamine, lignocaine. Uh, in patients where there is localized, relatively large areas of pain in segments of the body, we can try uh, neuromodulation, intrathecal drug delivery with morphine. We can try epidural infusions for patients with shorter life expectancies. There can be aggressive procedures where uh, chordotomies can be done where the pain tracts are uh, ablated. For patients with bone pains, cementoplasty, and there are surgical options. In a lot of patients, radiotherapy works and uh, nailing for prophylactic, uh, uh, you know, uh, fracture uh, fixation that can help in long bone pains in certain cases. So every time you have to individualize the treatment option depending on what you have and how difficult the pain is to manage. For uh, interventional pain procedures, there are factors that constitute a barrier. The awareness of the procedure, the limitations, the lack of training facilities, cost of these procedures and the attitude of the practitioners. It can be overzealous where every patient can be given an injection or sometimes it's underutilized because of fear of the above factors. So the key and the cornerstone like in every treatment plan is appropriate patient selection. The right patient selected at the right time and you will have good results. So this is Maslow and uh, psychologists are familiar with his Maslow's uh, needs, the hierarchy of needs where he evolved. And uh, one of his uh, aphorisms is the Maslow's hammer that it is tempting if the only tool that you have is a hammer to treat everything as if it were a nail. So we tend to generalize or we play to our skills. So if you're strong with using medications, you'd like to use it. If you want to do interventions, you're not confident about using potent opioids and you're not sure about neuropathic pain medications, you just point and shoot and give an injection. So there's a, a, a range of uh, options available and we tend to gravitate towards the things that we are comfortable with. Coming back to our patient, inspired by, of course, uh, Dame Cecily Saunders, I decided to give this man 14 years ago a lecture on what life was. Uh, not aware that he has seen more complex and he has had a more complex and rich life than I have uh, had because I'm just out of medical college and I have seen just my house and med school and books and then real life. And so I try to tell him that even this will pass away and I go into pop psychology. Uh, I wish I had a YouTube channel back then and I could have had made more money, but I try to do all of this for him. And he just tells me this. I have survived nine years after the first surgery. I'm not afraid of the cancer anymore. It's just the pain in I, pain that I need to have controlled. You leave the rest to me. So when we look at total pain, coping mechanisms of patients may vary. So every person comes with uh, an, an inborn resilience to deal with these situations. And sometimes they find it when they are more comfortable. They find it despite being in pain. So you see champions in this branch. I have been privileged to see champions every day of my uh, life at work. I'd like to summarize this entire talk by giving a few examples here. I refer to two steps back and one step forward. Whenever you get a patient with difficult pain, sometimes it's daunting because you feel that you're going back because this patient has already been seen by specialists, he has been seen by your colleagues, and they've already come to you with a basic trust deficit about whether you're good enough to manage all of this. So you retrace your steps, you go back and maybe you make small progresses. It might end up looking like this, but the reality is that you will actually be moving two steps forward. If we go back to the history, we'll end up doing a better job by retracing our steps and avoiding the things that didn't work in the previous instances or caused complications in the previous instances and thinking afresh, thinking out of the box. I gave the example of Maslow's hammer about how we gravitate towards things which are our strengths. So it's always strength in teams because you bring a group of people who have different skills and talents and we work together to address the pain of the individual, of the person. Medications that will help like methadone, ketamine, dexmedetomidine, lignocaine, there are different medications which come in handy in this state. Most of these pains, remember, are going to be neuropathic in nature. Interventions, as I said, can help and psychosocial interventions help a lot. I'll give one example of a patient whose numeric pain rating scale was a 10 on 10. 
when they are uh, seeing this. 10 on 10 pain and she comes to me and I take history and referred by a spine surgeon for a pain block in the spine for a, a disc. So the MRI shows a disc and she mentions ideation that she, uh, she might have self-harm. When we spoke about this, I said, when was your last visit to your psychiatrist? So she said, my last visit to the psychiatrist was about eight months ago. So when's your follow-up? I was supposed to follow up three months later. I did not follow up. So I asked this patient and the husband to make an immediate appointment with the psychiatrist and see them. Again, she went, saw the psychiatrist. Of course, I explained to the husband to keep an eye on her because she has ideation and she is a, a threatening self-harm. So I said, please men, uh, remember that you must keep an eye on her at all times. Go to the psychiatrist, take an opinion. So she went to the psychiatrist and the psychiatrist changed the course of antidepressants. She saw me a one, she saw me one month later. Nothing else had changed. Her pain scores that she reported in the clinic were two out of 10. So small nuances, you know, in managing patients' pain help. That does not mean all pain is psychological. It doesn't mean that all pain is physical. So it's a combination of different things that comes in and you have to assess it. I've had patients who have had PET scans and they have been curative for their pain because when they see that the disease is regressing, their pain reduces. So you'll see a lot of interesting uh, situations where difficult pain, apparently difficult pains may not be that difficult. However, there are challenges in dealing with difficult pains. Some of these challenges are one, there is a knowledge deficit. Pain medicine as a branch isn't taught enough. Even in uh, medical school, if you see Harrison's textbook of internal medicine, the first chapter on symptoms is on pain. And it's a comprehensive chapter, but that's not the one that is usually paid attention to. We like to look at our electrolytes. We look at, like to look at acid-base balances and uh, our liver function tests and so on. But when it comes to pain assessment, managing pains, the algorithms, except chest pain, of course, and uh, the American Heart Association has done a lot of good work with it. Everyone knows left side of the chest, if you have pain, you need to do something. But the other parts of the body are orphans when it comes to pain. Chronic pelvic pain in women, huge uh, area of uh, you know, that's need where it's ignored. So many aspects that uh, my myofacial pains, again, ignored. So there's a lot of areas where we need more knowledge. We need more training on doing pain. And most often pain is usually a, a second line branch in the sense people try to do another branch with it. And it kind of is relegated to the background. So it's just like another OPD. But we need more research in basic pain. And we also need more people managing pain well. The second part is resources. Now, just again, for the sake of interaction uh, to our uh, fellows, what is the, uh, pic who is this picture of? Any idea? Well, she said something in French. She said, kills manger de la brioche, which means let them eat cake. Mary Antoinette. Mary Antoinette. So this is the situation. Uh, this is Mary Antoinette. Uh, Although they say that it could have probably been Louis XVI's wife also who must have said this. But this is the problem that we approach, like when people asked her that the farmers and the peasants did not have bread to eat, she said, let them eat cake. And this is the problem. In terms of resources in our country, we try to talk about neuromodulation. I'm referring to India uh, and most nations across the world. We talk about neuromodulation, advanced procedures, advanced th therapy, methadone, oxycodone, and so many other things and fancy stuff. But we forget that a lot of times basic bread or basic essentials for pain medicine may not be available. So we face a dearth of resources. And even in resource, resource crunched situations, we have amazing work that is being done uh, in India and different countries. So hats off to everyone who practices uh, in, in these uh, scenarios. Finally, there is administrative, the issue of the powers that be, because medicine, like Perkov said, uh, is not just a science. It's also a social science. It's also a political science. The recent COVID crisis was 
a, a stark and a strong reminder. It still is a reminder today how medicine is intricately linked with politics and human life. So till doctors take a little more initiative and leadership positions, it will be difficult to uh, have uh, this sense or this push from administration about helping patients with difficult pain states, acknowledging basic needs in healthcare. So just to end with a very inspiring quote by Darwin and uh, not directly connected, of course, to this topic is how willing are we to change? How willing are we to go through this? And I'm sure you already have made that initial step. All of you who are uh, participating in fellowship programs like these, who are contributing a lot to patients around you, I'm sure you've already started off with these steps and uh, wish you all the best in your journey in palliative medicine, pain management, and helping patients. So I think I have stuck fairly well to time. And uh, if you have any questions, I'm good to take it. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mahesh. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, there is one question in the chat uh, by Dr. Yami. One is which medical specialities in India practice or can practice interventional procedures for pain relief? And the other one is any role of steroids for chronic difficult neuropathic pain? Thank you, Dr. Yamini, for these questions. In India, let me break this question down into two answers. In India, which medical specialities in India can practice pain relief? The answer is anybody can practice pain relief in India. When I came back from my fellowship training, I came home. And uh, my neighbor said that he has come from Singapore and I have knee pain, I will show him. And she came and uh, I wrote a medicine and I wrote a physiotherapy plan. And I said, if it doesn't work, I'll do some procedures. My mother came out of the kitchen and said, why you are taking this English medicine? Use ginger, she said. And then my father said, cha cha, ginger doesn't help. <laughs> Use this oil, I will give it to you. I had competition in my own house. So remember that, and they are non, not doctors. So you have competition everywhere. So anybody and everybody practices pain. Interventional procedures, physical medicine and rehab, anesthesiology and interventional radiology can practice. Uh, basic procedures, I feel family physicians can also do some basic bedside procedures. For example, if you see the American uh, board and family physicians, they do uh, baseline procedures, but I'm not sure how many of these procedures can be done, what can be done. Uh, nowadays with ultrasound, we do a lot of bedside procedures in our clinics also. So we have we don't have the PNDT issue overseas, so it's easier to do it. But yes, these are the three specialties that I know of. And of course, orthopedics and neurosurgery and the others. The second part is there is no role for prednisolone in chronic neuropathic pain. However, in patients who have neuropathic-like symptoms due to nerve infiltration, steroids may work. So, But that's, for chronic pains, it doesn't usually help. I just... Dr. Mahesh, uh, I have one consultation with you uh, for a patient of mine. This is a very difficult case. He's a very advanced case of uh, CA pancreas, and uh, he was started on morphine. Uh, initially, he was controlled with that, but then he started uh, having more and more pain. The pain was so intense. The morphine dosage was titrated up to even 500 milligrams a day and he was not uh, getting better. So I said, we can't go beyond that. I don't want to go beyond that because obviously it's not working. So uh, I took the help of Dr. Sunil and uh, we changed it to his, his medication to methadone. In fact, uh, with methadone, he was very well controlled, but then again, the same thing happened. We had to try to it up and up and up. And uh, uh, though he was getting better with those uh, higher titrations, but later on he became very uh, you know, immune to that, I should say. And uh, right now he's on almost 85 milligrams of methadone. Just today, his wife called and said, this is not working. What can we do in this case? I mean, uh, I'm at uh, a little bit of a quandary as to what we can do. Uh, any other intervention procedures we can try? Yes. So first of all, uh, uh, hats off to uh, Dr. Biju and your team for uh, helping these patients. They're very difficult cases, I understand. Uh, so my role in this answer will be a little like, you know, those who are watching uh, cricketers bat on TV and say, you know, you should play this way, you should play this way. Because on the field, the challenges that you face are going to be different and real time. But 
with ca pancreas one of the problems is i am assuming this patient has abdominal pain radiating to the back the lower back the sides exactly. and uh, and it, it it's clear, clearly because it's a deep seated retroperitoneal structures there's a lot of visceral sensitization in these patients in some in a subset of patients what happens is uh, due to multiple factors they get what is called as oih which is opioid induced hyperalgesia or they get tolerance and this subset of patients don't respond you can keep escalating uh, opioids for a long time and they usually don't uh, benefit with uh, these measures a simple thing to do would be to try a celiac plexus block or a splanchnic nerve block in case these are not available an epidural catheter can be put in just to desensitize the visceral uh, pain and you can request the help of anesthesiologists uh, and your colleagues and in case i'm i'm sorry i'm not aware if you are able if you are doing it if you are please uh, proceed with these measures yeah in fact uh, i now ours is a tertiary center uh, level center i can ask the uh, anesthetist uh, to do that but uh, i just want to take your opinion on that before we start it uh, makes sense because the the idea of doing the intervention is to desensitize the pain and give the patient a break also it helps in bringing down the dose of opioids if this pain patient had a uh, very good relief with the opioids and by very good relief i meant return to function was good mood sleep everything all the domains of pain were under control in that case we could look at uh, implanting an intrathecal device or putting an intrathecal catheter also but depending on the life expectancy of the patient so the initial bet is to try interventions like a celiac plexus or a splanchnic nerve block and uh, just sorry please continue in fact it was uh, such an advanced uh, uh, ca i thought probably he may not last uh... Oh, a month now it's almost two and a half months that is the problem he's just hanging on so and so his uh, pain is so intractable it is very difficult for his family to 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 see that and uh, the wife was almost at the, on the verge of tears when she called me today i said well, we'll see uh, and uh, this is exactly what i had in mind that we should go for some interventional procedures because uh, uh, this is not uh, uh, you know helping him anymore and uh, i'm assuming that you also putting this patient on neuropathic pain medications have you yes. tried we tried everything 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 so in that case it's better to try something more local yes. and uh, see if it helps and all the thank best you. thank you sir thank you so there is uh, there are a few more questions in the chat box one is about the uh, role of medication relaxation in chronic pain and uh, your opinion about uh, acupuncture so meditation and relaxation they help so cognitive behavioral therapy helps uh, we can still do more research on it the problem is that uh, uh, how do i put it as it's a, as i said it's a thought process by by that what i mean is that it also involves your cerebral cortex so the perception of pain also involves your cortex to for it to be registered as pain so for that um, uh you know we always refer to things like placebo and so on but there's nothing like placebo anything that works is actually medicine so if you can help with help your patient through techniques like calming meditation and relaxation if it can blunt the effect of pain uh in chronic pain of course it is useful in acupuncture there are um so the studies in acupuncture and chronic pain uh of course it's uh, if you look at literature it comes off with equivocal results but acupuncture doesn't work in the same way as the problem with western and eastern medicine is that western medicine is more individualized and eastern medicine uh, and since western medicine is more uh, individualized in terms of the statistical associations like you have a group of individuals and so on whereas eastern medicine is very individual energy uh, centric so uh, acupuncture works by the theory of energy lines you know so if you use acupuncture in these points it works in a different way but again we need more research if some of you actually might i know a lot of doctors who practice acupuncture uh it's not uh, it, it's a, of course it's a, a relatively cheaper option if you know it if you can try it and it helps some patients i think we should use it if it works in a subset of patients we should use it but we may not be able to use the same analogy and put it into western medicine and say in an rct so many patients it may or may not have worked in an rct if it works only for 5 less than 5% and we say it's not significant but for the 1% patient where it means a made a difference it's 100% relief so there's no harm in trying it uh, but with caution and not harming the patient these two principles should never change so another question is how much uh, 
Okay, is dry needling the same as acupuncture? No, uh, the famous acupuncture is acupuncture. Dry needling uses uh, needles. I have used uh, 25 gauge uh, spinal needles also to do dry needling, where we insert dry needles into trigger points in muscles for myofascial pain. So that you break myofascial trigger points with it, and uh, it works on a slightly different uh, principle of uh, muscle sensitization. Uh, how much requirement for interventional pain is there? Uh, it's by Dr. Gaja Saraj. And some of them have some pain after intervention, but uh, some are getting it back early too. How many percentage of patients get relief and uh, any statistics? So when I was in uh, Kokilabin Hospital, just for my understanding, I had done an audit of my work uh, over about five years or so. And uh, I found out that out of 100 patients, I would take about 10 patients for interventions, 10 to 20. So one in five to one in 10 patients, because of course it's a specialist pain clinic. Again, in these one or in these patients, when we do procedures and out of 100 patients where interventions are done, 70% patients get good benefit. 30% patients, they don't, they get very low levels of pain relief. And there are outliers, like 10% are cured for life. And then 10% there is re zero relief in pain. In this middle band of about 80% uh, patients, most of them have an average 50 to 70% pain relief. This is in chronic pain states. The idea is not the pain relief by the visual analog scale, which just mention, measures one dimension of the pain. The other dimensions of pain in terms of return to function, mood, impact on the patient's functioning, this is very important, impact on quality of life. So if all of these parameters are better, you, you have done a good job. Reduction in the opioids, this is a good job because we usually measure just the visual analog scale. Another point that I would like to share is after an intervention, uh, there's this uh, surgeon called Dr. Bogdak in Australia who did a, he did a lot of work with interventional spine. So someone asked him in a conference, what is the uh, appropriate time for pain relief after a procedure? So he mentioned that the patient should have pain relief till the time they have paid their bill, at least. So having said this, in medicine, at least till the patient walks out of your clinic, they should have pain relief after the intervention, you know. But uh, jokes apart, your patients come back in three to six months, but if they're not prepared about it, it also depends on how you're selling it. So a lot of times to convince the patient for a procedure, you know, it is like, uh, uh, you know, uh, an, a marriage proposal gone wrong, saying that our boy is really very good and it turns out the boy is not as good as he, they say he is, you know. So you have to really make sure that what you're promising is what you deliver. Please inform the patients, communicate well that the block may work in a, in most of the patients in 10 to 20%, it may not work. And it will work for a small period of time. So the first three or four months when the block works, you're God. And when the block fails, suddenly the patients will turn around and say, we spent so much money, no use and what is this? So you have to sensitize them and educate them and work with them as partners. We tend to patronize our patients, unfortunately, a lot. But with shared decision-making, it helps really. Our patients really do well with it. They are aware of it. They come back for the follow-up. They stick to the schedule. Of course, there will be patients who will not be happy with whatever you do. That's a different subset. But most patients uh, understand if we educate them well. Uh, there is one patient story by Dr. Punita uh, She says she has a 39-year-old uh, female with chronic pain. Uh, for 12 years and multiple MRI brain, spine, and EOC all were normal. Two extensive rheumatology workups were negative. This patient uh, tells about total pain. Initially more in left hand fingers and the left leg. Lodania also present. She's on Venla vaccine on incremental doses from a psychiatrist. She says finger and toe swelling, not so much. She responded to Vicelon. Now on um, NRS two to three, uh, she is tapering it. Uh, and they also gave a IV ketamine, a clonidine and lignocaine low dose infusion for desensitization. It helped her. So now should I do any hormone test to see HPA gonadal axis suppression? What's your suggestion? So the only hormonal test that uh, the patient would need to do apart from the HPA gonadal axis suppression and steroids is uh, your thyroid profile, the patient's thyroid profile has to be done. Whatever is being described by Dr. Danasekar in 
uh, if we have a checklist called the uh, fibromyalgia criteria by the rheumatology association you have criteria about the widespread pain index that you can keep uh, uh, this is of course a non cancer pa uh, pain related situation i am assuming and in these patients uh, it's a clinical diagnosis after excluding all the reversible other uh, medical causes like for example uh, lyme disease and a few other conditions can manifest as this post viral syndromes can manifest as this but for 12 years it's a long phenomenon there's a lot of sensitization the approach is correct ketamine you helps we used to give ketamine infusions in our opds to patients with fibromyalgia like conditions i would call them chronic widespread pains and it helps so meeting an endocrinologist is really a good idea i think that should be done and uh, medications for fibromyalgia there are like few medications which help pregabalin duloxetine snri is like venlafaxine they help uh, the psychiatrist helps usually not because as a cause and effect thing but being in pain for 12 years does take a toll and having somebody to help out with these these stressors is very useful so yes i would i would rec i would suggest uh, seeing an endocrinologist also and uh, uh, you know the ketamine is a good idea once in few months but lower doses they can go for higher dose of ketamine i don't i, I don't see if there's any evidence for clonidine but ketamine yes i use this clonidine as a like uh, what you call pre medication for ketamine mm. okay like fair enough dexmedetomidin x so a very yes. use of clonidin and then ketamine so uh, we can use uh, uh, we've used ketamine and we have not used pre medication ketamine in the doses that we've been giving uh, and lignocaine yes that's done in the that we used to do it in the critical care areas with monitoring because of protocols by nabh and so on but otherwise these are two good options yes i have put uh, 50 mg of lignocaine uh 50 mg of ketamine oh okay 75 mg of clonidin mm -hmm. this is ibbd and it goes for 3 days 3 days and mm -hmm. she gets discharged and she is quite happy for one a month or so or at least 45 days then she comes back okay so yes yeah, so these are difficult cases i agree with you widespread pains are difficult uh, situations cognitive behavioral therapy works in some of these patients uh psychiatrists unfortunately may not be uh, in a position to deliver this so you need a clinical psychologist there are certain chronic pain groups in india which is founded by patients who have not been listened to enough uh i can share some of those resources and these pa the patient can reach out on those groups also uh sometimes it becomes problematic because with patient groups where they are all disgruntled it can actually uh, provoke a lot of negative uh, feelings but this is a fairly sensible group they at least point out point uh, you know the right resources they educate their patients and so on and there is one question what are the complications of intervention any sharp needle entering the body can cause hemorrhage infection or nerve injury the biggest complication is that the patient has no pain relief and they start complaining about you the other issues are very site specific for example uh, if you are looking at uh say the celiac plexus uh there are very rare chances of paraplegia very rare chances if you're looking at uh, epidurals you can have epidural abscesses so there are very site specific complications also but these are some of the three basic issues hemorrhage infection and uh, trauma to the structures there ultrasound guided celiac plexus neurolysis is done patient is lying down and we put the transducer and you can just hit the axis where the uh, celiac trunk branches off from the aorta and you can put alcohol in front of the uh, celiac trunk there so you go through the liver you go through viscous and so on so if you as i said on a, on any given day unless the patient is taken into uh, the confidence and we discuss all of these openly with patients it's difficult the chances are less if it's performed by trained personnel with good imaging guidance not blind techniques because we must understand that all these procedures used to be done maybe 100 years ago with uh, without any imaging guidance and with thicker needles and uh, more aggressive uh, volumes so the the body is very uh, resolute so the complications are there yes but there's fine 
specific and we need to be mindful of it and take good training what is the percentage of alcohol or phenol uh, used for neural flexes like celiac flexes block so i use uh, i would use around 50% alcohol phenol is manufactured again phenol is a little difficult because your uh, the pharmacist will have to make it for you fresh and send it over so i'm not too comfortable with phenol but i'm comfortable with absolute alcohol that's 50% i don't use stronger concentrations uh, though our uh, different uh, specialist textbooks may, may mention it differently i also use lower volumes and i have stopped using alcohol because i find that fluids are very difficult to predict once you inject them except in certain areas i try not to use alcohol i use planckneck radio frequency and uh, because i have access to the machine even in bombay i used to use in mumbai I used to use the same thing but i have done alcohol procedures and 3 to 4 ml of alcohol on either side with planckneck nerves helps intercostal areas about half to 1 ml with ultrasound guidance we would do and around specific nerves like brachial plexus sheets or lumbar plexus we can instill about anywhere a volume of about 2 to 5 ml depending on how how what what the tumor is the problem is if these areas the neural structures are in pain are causing pain that that must that means that there is some amount of tumor infiltration so you might have to go a little more proximal to it and if you're going more proximal you end up going into the cord you're in you end up going into the spinal cord so there are uh, specialists who do alcohol neurolysis of the in the spinal cord and in different areas but they put very low volumes it is done and uh, that helps at segmental levels because the alcohol just remains there and uh, numbs the nerve but interactions at 0.1 ml or so on uh, how how far is the nerve blocks can be done on same site uh good question how frequently uh usually we do it once in a few months it's clear that if you have to do the block in like 2 to 3 weeks it's clear that whatever you have done is not working so you can't kind of reinvent the wheel you need to go back and analyze it maybe it was not done well the first time round and the second time you need to have imaging or something like that but uh, usually about 3 to 6 months later we we can do nerve blocks depending on the again it's uh, different for different people uh like if it's a degenerative disc disease with an L, like a disc herniation and you want to do an injection so that the patient can say avoid a surgery or if it is you know is a borderline case mm. where the patient may have surgery or not so you can repeat the block i have repeated a block in as less as one week for a doctor who uh, and this is the spine surgeon who told me to repeat it because and it worked for the patient fortunately and he was able to avoid surgery but um it's difficult to say this you know so 3 to 6 months i think is a fair amount of time also patients willingness to come back for a procedure that didn't work once the thresholds are different because patients judge you they say that if it's not worked enough well enough it won't work well enough the second time so uh, this is there and the third observation that i have is sometimes the first block may work for 6 months the second may work for a shorter period of time so you need to really uh, go back to the case and find out what happened why is this patient coming back any more questions you can unmute and speak so uh, still it can be on block through the thyroid is it safe so i had an i had access i was lucky to have access to an ultrasound machine uh, in 2007 and 8 and i wanted to reach the longus coli so a lot of procedures that i would do were point and shoot to hit the area now i do all my procedures with the american society of regional anesthesia approach but in patients with altered anatomy you can go through the thyroid putting a needle in the thyroid is not uh unsafe because otherwise we would be doing thyroid biopsies so you can go through the thyroid but that again is an altered anatomy in this patient the anatomy was altered so he had a lot of contractures on that side to reach the stellate this is the median approach so i would use the median approach in patients after modified neck dissections it's not described much here so keep doing a lot of things and uh, it may not be uh, described in literature but uh, 
you need to reach that point somehow you know so you have to modify on table you have to modify the approach but thanks for picking that up so that's not the conventional approach they usually go from lateral to medial Does tapinatol help in neuropathic pain? What's your experience? Um, again, I have no conflict of interest, but I like tapinatol over tramadol because uh, it's a mu nor agent. It works on mu and uh, noradrenergic reuptake inhibition, so it helps with uh, pain relief in neuropathic pain states. Especially mixed pains, it's easier if you don't have access to too much opioids. And tapinatol is available. You can try it for nerve pains. Where, wherever you would think of trying tramadol, you can try tapentadol because it was less uh, facilitating than tramadol. Sir, can you put some light on post laminectomy syndrome that is failed uh, back surgery syndrome? So, again, uh, so in a short, uh, in, in, in a concise manner, if a patient comes to you with pain after spine surgery, there are two reasons. One is the intervention was not appropriate, which is very rare because spine surgeons uh, take a lot of care. And the second part is that there is an element of sensitization in this patient. Uh, now, an analysis of this patient, you have to look at the pain and see where the patient's pain is. This patient's getting pain in the mid, mid back area or patient's getting pain in the legs. And depends on it, you try to look at the pain generator and try to target those areas with select interventions, which will help you with diagnosis and treatment. At the same time, you need to look a little above the spine, maybe about one to two feet above the spine to an area called the brain and talk to the patient and find out what's happening. Understand what this person is going through because there's a lot of uh, other issues which may influence this. Deconditioned muscles may affect relief. Sometimes after instrumentation, patients may have persistent pain for three to six months. They might expect dramatic relief. So we need to take them through the process of physical therapy and healing uh, as partners because we need to uh, train them about it so sometimes the approach is i go in for a surgery it's done and i go out but what about the deconditioning that led to the degeneration most spine surgeries for degeneration have uh, have issues because of these factors because the primary factors may not change patients may have tender facets and some patients may go into neural sensitization so you need to desensitize them also so this is post laminectomy syndromes and uh, they can be difficult to treat, but some patients may develop fibrosis after a few months and they come back with increased pain after a few months. So you might have to do adhesiolysis. So there are different things that may be done for patients. But so what how, the... how to do that desensitization? So with intervention, sometimes we put in epidural uh, uh, infusions which help in relieving the pain. But work with a spine surgeon, discuss the probability of it being adhesion, because adhesiolysis helps in some cases. In some cases, radiofrequency denervation helps. Simple epidural blocks help in some patients. Sometimes it's adjacent level, uh, adjacent level disease. So work with the spine surgeon, because patients sometimes don't like the spine surgeon. I don't know if you were aware of this, but uh, just about a year and a half ago, I think a year ago, there's this spine surgeon in the US who was actually shot dead by... Uh, patient because he was experiencing persistent pain after surgery. So the patient walked into uh, the spine surgeon's office and gun availability being a little easier, he was able to uh, procure a gun and he was able, he, he shot the spine surgeon who operated on him. So it can be very distressing for patients. So as a, so just a question, as a radiation oncologist, we keep seeing a lot of contracture related pains because of poor physiotherapy and post-op radiation care, they develop and a delayed follow-up that we can't pick it up early. They come in with more severe pain because of uh, these uh, radiation induced contractures. So is there, what should we do in such a situation? Is it chronic medication or do you have an alternative? So a lot of times these patients, for example, after head, face, neck, which is very common in India, when we radiate them, they start developing contractures of the neck and uh, branches of the superficial cervical plexus, they get entrapped because everything hardens up and these patients get a lot of pain along the scar regions as well. So infiltrating these scars under ultrasound in that superficial level, infiltrating it with ultrasound actually helps in relieving it in this, this pain. 
uh, as you rightly said, we must, uh, you know, there is no treatment for poor physiotherapy. You need to have good physiotherapy. And medications do help in some patients. We use skin patches in some cases where, you know, you can apply lignocaine transdermal patches. It was available for a small time in India when I was practicing. In between, it had gone off stock. I think it is available again. So you can use those patches. And going back to physiotherapy where they can do uh, myofacial releases and so on, that can help. And of course, nerve blocks may help. Uh, with enthusiastic uh, specialists, uh, you know, some of us are very enthusiastic. So if we have a pointed object and one enthusiastic patient, we can put a needle anywhere. So, so any procedure can be tried with the right imaging, but uh, it can help, you know, localized diagnostic blocks can help. So uh, how do we write a prescription for the myofascial pain release? Like if we have to refer him to a doctor? So you can refer to a physiotherapist and ask, speak with them, pick up the phone, speak with them and ask them that this patient seems to have a contracture and there is pain. Probably it is myofascial in nature. Do you work on it? If they say yes, some of them do dry needling, some of them do releases and they do therapy with it. They can help. Some of them use uh, percutaneous methods like electrodes, like the TENS and all of that. It will at least help with desensitizing that area and help the patient. So we can try these things for them. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, sir. I think uh, uh, we need to move on to the patient story. Um, so, uh, Dr. Biju Gobi will be presenting uh, today's patient story. Dr. Biju, uh, good evening. Am I audible to everybody? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. Good evening to everybody. Good evening, Dr. Sunil, sir. Uh, Dr. Mahesh for an excellent presentation. My name is Dr. Biju Gopi. I'm working as a specialist palliative physician in uh, Medical Trust Hospital in Nagala. Uh, this is uh, the story of uh, uh, an elderly gentleman, uh, 83 years old. Uh, when I was uh, asked to see him first, uh, I was asked to see him in his house. Uh, the diagnosis was uh, corticobacillar degeneration. And that was the main diagnosis. And he had many other uh, diseases like uh, Parkinsonism, hypertension, diabetes, hypothyroidism, et cetera. But uh, mainly this uh, degenerative disease was his main problem. Uh, so come to the next slide, please. Uh, when I saw him, uh, the first thing which I noticed was he was, as if in delirium, he was crying incessantly, he was, not responding to uh, any questions uh, and and uh, the the uh, relatives told me that you know he has been like that for the past seven days he has not slept he has not eaten he has not uh, made any uh, any response to whatever they were asking him because he was on a lot of medications he refused all his medications and even the family was it is as at their wit's end as to what to do so uh, uh, he also had uh, constipation. That was a chronic thing uh, with him and uh, sometimes difficulty in maturation also, which is what they have told me because he was unable to speak at all. Uh, next slide, please. Now, uh, uh, according to them, as I said, you know, the delirium started about uh, a week ago. He was constantly agitated without sleep, howling and crying incessantly. He was not responding. He had tremors and spasticity because uh, of his uh, in a part and so on, so because of the regeneration. Uh, he was not responding to queries. He had uh, uh, and uh, no sleep, refusing food, all those all those things we have mentioned before. Uh, but uh, he was he was able to respond about a week ago. But then uh, the family didn't know what 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 to do because he was seen by. Uh, an array of uh, specialists and consultants, mainly neurologists and psychiatrists. Uh, can you please go down the next uh, slide, please? Next slide, please. And uh, uh, they had given him uh, a lot of uh, medications, but uh, since the past seven days, he was not responding to anything. He was refusing everything. So I looked at this person and uh, for half an hour, I was looking at him and he was holding his, uh, his hand, his, I think his uh, left hand and his right hand, and, uh, and, and he, as he was cradling uh, it because of, uh, of some difficulty. 
The general examination was a normal uh, saturation was all right. Uh, GRBs was non 40, no jaundice, no pallor, no lymphadenopathy, no pretal edema. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, all the systemic examinations except the CNS was normally was in delirium, of course. He has spastic ex extremities, muscular atrophies, and Pakistani dramas. Uh, can you come to the next slide, please? Uh, the investigations were all normal uh, except that he had a little bit of pus cells. Uh, in the urine, which was uh, uh, because of his uh, BPH. Uh, and uh, the, the brain MRI showed uh, cortical basilar degeneration. And this diagnosis was confirmed by uh, at Sri Chitra Medical Center, which is one of the pioneers uh, in uh, neurological uh, diseases, and kind of reconfirmed in Aston Medical College. And all these uh, neurologists had given him an uh, array of medical medicines and saying that, you know, there's nothing more to be done to this patient because this is a degenerative disease. And, uh, many a time that he had been taken to the hospital with this kind of delirious uh, state and they said uh, nothing more can be done because this is as a result of the degeneration. And so they brought him back and uh, that was when I saw him uh, at that uh, moment with, with, with such an agony uh, in him. Can you come down please? Next slide. Uh, he, these were the medicines he was on, sodium valpoid, uh, eltroxin for his hypothyroidism, dipterocetin, dose actin, uh, You know, yeah, go ahead, please come back. Again, come down, please. Now, uh, the come to psychosocial uh, aspects of his, uh, uh, of this person. He was a Navy veteran. He was retired from the Christian Naval Base at the time. He was survived by his wife and two children. He had a son and a daughter. A daughter the son was in the US, he was a pharmacist. Daughters uh, married to a very high profile professor from IT. They had, they were very well to do. They had a very good house. They had, uh, they were not financially constrained. So he had the best of uh, the treatment. Uh, he was an active church member. He used to help out the poor, and uh, you know he was he was a philanthropic gentleman. He used to help the community. So uh, there was no psychosocial problem for the uh, the person or his family at all. Please next slide, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, again, as I said, these, these are the medicines he was on. Uh, when I saw him, uh, what struck me was he was holding his hand and crying. As he was crying, he was howling and shouting, but he was like, as he was crying. So I just went to him. He was not looking at me. He was looking at the ceiling with no eye contact, nothing, no, no response. I said, sir, are you in pain? This is one thing which I asked him. And suddenly, as he, he woke up from sleep, he said, yes, I am in pain. And the whole of the family was actually there. And if they wouldn't have heard it, they wouldn't have believed me. They said, he said, I'm in pain. So that was a, a shocking uh, revelation for me as well, because I did not expect him to be in pain. Because uh, uh, when, when they heard it, when the family heard it, they said, sir, so none of the consultants, none of the doctors ever... And uh, I said, but he himself has admitted that he is in pain. And then he went back to the same state of howling and crying. So I had to convince the family that, you know, he is in pain and no pain medication was ever given to him. So I need to start him on uh, pain medication. And uh, as he is in, uh, as uh, Dr. Mahesh was saying, almost 10 out of 10, I said, there's no point in starting Tramadol or, uh, you know, one of the NSAIDs or anything like that. I said, it's a very complex uh, neuropathic pain probably. So we had to start on. Uh, morphine. So, you know, the word morphine is a, is a, is a horrifying thing for many people. So, and to the, especially to this particular family, because they were not exposed to the word pain at all in this particular uh, patient. So I had to sit with them, I had to counsel them, I had to count, uh, you know, convince them that we'll start on a very small dose of 10 milligrams, but it has to be given four hourly, and then we will titrate it from there, and then we'll see how he responds. So as he, uh, as he was on, already on all the medicines which we are seeing on the screen, uh, they said, okay, let's try this also. So this, I said, he was actually staying at, uh, almost 30 kilometers away from me. So I, I told the, uh, the, the uh, children, I said, please let me know after 24 to 48 hours how he is responding to the pain. So if uh, he's not, then we'll have to titrate it and then we'll, we'll have to modify it. So he said, yes. On the second day, nobody called. So I called that side and I asked what happened. What is the outcome? Yeah. So then, uh, uh, the uh, son said that there is, there is no, no change at all in his pain. 
Uh, he's Dr. Biju will be extremely sorry, but I think you got muted. I'm sorry for that. Yeah, can you hear me now? So yes, I, I was a little, I was also a little disappointed as to why he was not responding to pain because he has, uh, he obviously was in pain. Then I asked uh, in detail, uh, how many milligrams did he give? How frequently did he give? Then the son told me we have given only four, two times. Well, that that was the answer. I said that is the reason why he was he was still in pain. I said it has to be given the right time and the right dosage. So let us give me a chance to be, to prove me myself wrong because it may not work. But at least give him the chance to 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 try it out. So the son said, okay, sir, we have been giving almost twenty five medicines and it, none of it worked. Almost for seven months he was in agony. So why don't we try this at uh, again? There's no harm. So I said go ahead. So we took another forty eight hours and then. Uh, I, they didn't call me back and I called that side and I asked, how is he? Then uh, uh, as a response, the son said, Sir, just wait a second. Then he put on, uploaded a video for me, a small clip where this old gentleman was actually talking to his grandson. So I thought it was one of the, one of the old video clips. I said, I know he, this is one of the old clips, but how is he now? He said, this is yesterday's clip. He, he woke up from that delirium, believe me, and then he started talking, he started talking coherently, he sat up, he was actually chatting with his, his uh, grandson. That was the dramatic effect which uh, the pain relief had on him. Of course, he used to have break, uh, breakthrough pains and, pains and things like that. So, and he had uh, acute urinary retention also. So we had to catheterize him. Uh, his uh, constipation had to be relieved. So after all this and fine tuning the, uh, the morphine uh, dosage to almost about 30 to 40 milligrams Q4H, he was totally controlled. Uh, believe me, see, the, the reason why I wanted to present this is that the, the, the remedy was so simple, but it, it was even so late. And so this poor man was suffering so much. And uh, uh, this, this is, this is uh, where I want to... Uh, touch on a few things which I'm coming to later. Uh, then uh, we said, I said that, you know, instead of giving him uh, for four hourly because he had a little bit of difficulty in swallowing. I said, why don't we give uh, uh, as a patch? I said, but we can change it over to, uh, uh, you know, fentanyl patch and we titrate the dose and we gave him 25, I think, yeah, it was 25 milligrams, I'm oh, sorry, micrograms per hour of uh, fentanyl patch. And he was absolutely control with that and he had a very good quality of life he started talking to people he came to the uh, you know table to eat and uh, almost for four or five months he had a very good interaction with the, with the family and the family also was so happy and as he was a navy veteran can you just go down uh, the, the slides please yeah this is what i was talking you know his quality of life improved Dramatically, yeah. Go ahead, please. Go ahead. I was I was talking about these slides. Go ahead. Go down. Yeah, and nobody has addressed uh, the pain before. Go ahead. Go down. Go down, please. So uh, this uh, kind of uh, uh, you know relief uh, for, was not only for the patient. This was also a relief for the whole family because his wife was uh, almost. Uh, refusing to believe that uh, he is having this disease and uh, that he is, you know, deteriorating. So she needed time to uh, accept the, 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 the facts. But when he was uh, cured, or rather getting better and having, having a better quality of life, I, I told them very specifically that please don't forget that his degenerative disease is still on because you have a false hope that, you know, he is getting cured. But I said, no, he's not getting cured. We are just controlling his pain. And so he's having good quality of life, but his degeneration is still going on. And so he will have effects of that later on in life. How long we can never predict, but it is definitely going to kick in. And that is exactly what happened uh, after four or five months of such beautiful, uh, you know, uh, uh, lucid period. When uh, the Navy, in fact, they came forward, they wanted to give him a plaque for uh, uh, you know, accolading his service in the Navy. And as he was bedridden, they were not able to do that. They came back and they gave that uh, trophy to him and he was very happy to receive it. Uh, the family was happy to receive it. And so, you know, it was all very beautiful moments. Uh, but very slowly he deteriorated his 
uh, uh, he had a facial paralysis and then uh, he had difficulty in deglutition. He started uh, choking, so I had to put him NG on NG tube feeding. Uh, but slowly he deteriorated over a period of one, one and a half months. Uh, very peacefully uh, in the sleep, he passed away. But the family was so thankful that, you know, he was taken care of and towards the last moments he was totally rid of pain and he had a very good quality of life and so they could spend some quality time with him. Can you go down to the last slide, please? Go oh, no, no, this is the summary. And uh, see, the, the, the reason why I brought this uh, uh, case was we have to be very uh, meticulous in what we do. And this is told by the, the, uh, the definition of palliative medicine, which uh, says that you know palliative care is an approach that improves the quality of life of patients and their relatives facing uh, you know, uh, very uh, life-threatening illness by way of uh, mitigating the or reducing the, the suffering by meticulous, you know, uh, examination, meticulous history taking and taking care of the pain as a whole, both physical, psychosocial and spiritual. That is the essence of that uh, of the of the palliative uh, care, uh, you know, definition by WHO. In this case, I am so happy to say that you know, word to word, we could uh, do justice to that patient. You know, we could alleviate his suffering, not only his suffering but his family suffering. We could improve the quality of life of the patient, uh, and 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 by very intricate, uh, you know, very simple, no interventional uh, investigations or nothing. Just by history taking and just meticulous examination, we could uh, find out what was the problem and that problem was mitigated by, by very simple methods whereby they had very good quality of life and the, the family had uh, you know, time to accept that you know, he has to ultimately go and they were all prepared for that and they gave him a very fitting fare for, farewell. So uh, that is what I wanted to talk. So difficult pain can be in so many uh, different ways as Dr. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Mahesh was saying uh, it can be, uh, uh, you know, needing interventional treatments, uh, even sophistication uh, uh, um, uh, you know, methods, but at the same time, it also can also be mitigated by very simple, uh, you know, uh, uh, remedies if we are very um, you know, meticulous about our, our, our way of approaching palliative care. And yesterday, this also touched what we were trying to talk about the other day about euthanasia. I asked uh, my mentor and my sir when I was doing palliative, uh, I said, why, why can't we do uh, euthanasia? Because there's so much of suffering, there's so much of uh, you know, pain, uh, which we are not able to take care. But that the, his answer was, Biju, the thing is, if we can do palliative care the right way, the right way, there is no place for euthanasia, which is what I felt when after after treating patients like this. You know, uh, many or many a time, uh, I've read, as I said the other day, I quoted that also that in Switzerland, most of the doctors who had advocated euthanasia for their patients and who had sent them to, to, you know, for euthanasia later on regretted saying that you know, if, had we waited and. Had we mitigated the pain of that particular person, then he wouldn't have asked for euthanasia, which is actually so. Uh, uh, those of you, uh, you who want to do palliative medicine who are already practicing this, this is what we have to do. We have to be very meticulous in all our approach, very very prudent in how we treat the patient, and believe me, we can we can increase or elevate the uh, quality of life of those patients who even know those patients who are dying. Thank you so much. If you can just come down, I just want to show two photographs which I have taken, done, I mean, uh, put on with the permission of the family. I uh, usually we mask the eyes, but this is the patient. If you see, can see him holding the hand, this is after I started morphine, after the pain was alleviated, see how he was holding, but he is calm. Look at his eyes. I showed his eyes only with the permission of the, of the family, only to show him, you know, uh, he's out of his agony. So if you can come down, please. If you can just come down. One more, one more picture. 
yeah, this is the black uh, he had received from the Navy for his, uh, you know, uh, for his service and see how he is uh, receiving. He is sitting on a chair in a chair and receiving it. And this was the same man who was hardly about two months ago who was uh, delirious and uh, in agony and crying. So this is what we can do for our patients if we are very meticulous in how and what we do. Thank you so much. Uh, the, so uh, actually, the, we are coming to the discussions uh, point. Uh, one major concern, I think, uh, the points to to note uh, is, yeah, he is uh, he is he was in a delirious state. How would you uh, you know assess and say make a judgment that he is in pain or not? This is this is you know this goes for every patient who has got. Uh, an altered level of consciousness. How will you assess whether the per person is in pain and how will you treat that pain? So this was one of the uh, challenging questions which I faced, but uh, uh, th I think this needs to be addressed. Uh, if there are any other uh, you know, ways which you can find out how a person is, uh, you know, whether a person is suffering uh, in, in a stuporous condition or even an unconscious patient, I had I, I still have a patient who was who was uh, who had a CVA after after COVID. She is uh, totally non-responsive, but but she occasionally uh, moans, and that moaning we attributed to pain. And then I examined her again because she cannot talk, and uh, only the relatives say, say that she is uncomfortable because otherwise she's very calm. She's on NGT and. Uh, feeding and things like that. Uh, sorry, Dr. Biju, can we uh, move on to the uh, participants? Um, yeah, yeah. I, about I, I, your I, I, yeah, go ahead, please. If anybody, how will you convince the family that he is in agony or he is suffering? If you can answer. Anybody has uh, any comments on uh, assessing pain in patients uh, who are unable to communicate. Anybody? You were telling that he was holding the hands. That means maybe some bladder issues. Uh, so, sorry, uh, you uh, probably you have uh, logged in from two devices. A lot of echo is coming from your end. Uh, I think uh, I would ask uh, Dr. Mahesh about this, uh, uh, about his opinion uh, regarding. Uh, I saw that uh, there is uh, one. Uh, uh, one uh, comment on starting morphine in non uh, non cancer pain and uh, also regarding the pain assessment in non uh, patients who are unable to communicate dr manus so uh, first of all thank you dr biju for sharing this case and thank you to the patient's family also for sharing this part of their life which is very sensitive with all of us uh, a remarkable job and i'm very happy that the patient was very comfortable uh, this is a privilege, as I said, to work every day with patients like these. Now, uh, coming to this question, so for all of us, when pain assessment, I think Madam was saying that if you know the patient's holding the hand, Radha Madam was saying that it could indicate, you know, some bladder issues or some pain, uh, something similar like that. Uh, so, in patients who can communicate, the best way to ask patients who are in pain is to ask them. This is, of course, the golden rule. If the patient says they have pain, they have pain. Even this in patients who can express verbally, it is not asked enough. So patients who definitely don't communicate, it is almost neglected. In fact, in intensive care and critical care areas, the pain is assumed to be uh, non-existent. And in the non-verbal population, there are some tools which can uh, help. If you don't mind, if I can just share the screen while you were talking, I just took a small screenshot to demonstrate one such tool. Yes, yes. So, so some of the tools that uh, we can use in critical care areas are something called a CPOT scale or a behavioral scale where you know you can look at different expressions and this goes up to a score of eight. This can be used even if your patient is intubated. So you can use the critical care pain observatory tool, observation tool. It's very simple. 
and it relies on body movements. Now, for patients who are locked in, uh, paralyzed, you have very little baseline to go with. So you look at the autonomic parameters and assume that you know tachycardia is equivalent to pain and so on. But in palliative care, the general rules like preventing distension of the viscera, preventing retention, preventing constipation, all of these help. Another simple trick to remember is that any delirious patient, elderly patient, will become delirious because of pain. So patients, elderly patients who come geriatrics, they come to you with delirium, two possibilities, urine infection or any other infection, pneumonia or pain. So these are the two things that can cause them to become delirious. In children, there are different pain scales which are used, like the FLAC scale and so on. And in neonates also, there are different scales which are used in specialty centers. So in all groups, we can use measures to, uh, to assess pain in non-verbal patients. But yes, it starts by acknowledging that yes, this patient may have pain. Then it's uh, believe and you know start treating these patients accordingly. I hope this was clear. Uh, what's uh, your opinion regarding uh, the use of uh, more, uh, strong opioids in non-cancer pain? So um, the, the background to the strong opioid thing, a lot of our literature in India is influenced by the literature from the West. So from a phase of enthusiasm with the oxycodone saga, when the West went into uh, excessive use of opioids for non-cancer conditions to stigmatizing opioids and you know now they are uh, working on the other way so we are also trying to follow them but because we are behind we are running behind them a little with a, a little bit of a lag so we run behind them and they are already swinging to the other side so we run behind them this way so this is bound to happen uh, in India the, uh, the an inherent advantage of the Indian patient is that we don't like to take medicines we just hate taking any medicines. We will take any random things that are cooked up at home in the name of medicine. But if you tell us that it's a pill and it's manufactured, we hate it. So this actually protects our patients from opioids. They say morphine, they run away. Yeah, from the wheelchair, they will get up and run away. So having said this, uh, the best way to handle these patients in with strong opioids, again, let me show you the algorithm. So what this patient probably had because of corticobasal degeneration, Remember, as neurologists, if there are any neurologists on the panel also, conventional training in neurology is on optics. Remember this, that anything that shakes, tremors or seizures, you have a lot of research on it. Stroke, you have a lot of research on it. All of these are based on motor deficits. But you look at sensory neuropathy and you look at the amount of research that is done into painless or painful sensory neuropathy, it is very scarce. Because these are things which are not felt and not visible. So if you look at stroke, you look at tremors, you look at seizures, you'll have a, an algorithm there. But for neuropathic pain and anything that is felt, there is very little work because you haven't researched it uh, as well. So I'll just show you another slide for central neuropathic pain. This is just for all the, the fellows that uh, hopefully it will help you. Just put a summary slide from an article. I can share that later. So this is just uh, an article on a review of neuropathic pain guidelines. So these are different society guidelines on neuropathic pain. So if you see the first line of gabapentinoids, in my opinion, we could uh, titrate the gabapentinoids in this patient a little more. However, uh, if it's not working at 75, my experience is if you increase it, it makes the patient only drowsy and it doesn't work. They are drowsy and in pain. The second line, opioids. So opioids can be used for neuropathic pain states. Although for non-cancer pain, opioids are not preferred in the sense you wouldn't prefer to use it first because it might affect return to function. So in select group of non-cancer pain patients, I used to deal with a lot of patients with vasculitis and rheumatological phenomena where we had to use opioids because the target is the return to function, return to quality of life. Anything that helps restore these parameters, I think you're on the right track. So this is just a table for all of us to see. I'll just read out the first line is, the SNRIs, gabapentinoids, and the TCAs. Second line is going to be opioids and tramadol. The third line is stronger opioids. In this patient, you may actually even use small doses of methadone. So methadone can be used as first line in certain patients. Actually, he was already on uh, uh, pregabalin and uh, all the rest yes, of the yes, I saw that. He was on pretiapine, pregabalin. He was on multiple medications. Yes, uh, so just uh, one comment. Um, uh, so, um, 
this patient uh, also has uh, dementia and i see there is parkinsonism uh, so uh, there are some specific pain scales or a pain uh, measuring instruments which are used in connection with the specific conditions so um, in dementia uh, it's actually there are uh, many instruments used but the one is uh, uh, actually it says uh, as far as possible you should talk to the patient and find out the subjective uh, experience of the patient but if that cannot be done then there is something called uh, pain or that is pain assessment in advanced dementia yeah. and that is a scale uh, which actually uh, observe the behavior of the patient uh, which includes uh, breathing pattern the vocalization of the patient facial expression body language and uh, are we able to console the patient and uh, from this we can get a score and, uh, then according to the uh, score, uh, we can uh, classify the pain. And uh, there are uh, some more scales also proposed uh, in dementia. That's dollar plus two scales and elderly caregiving assessment uh, tool. So, uh, but basically all these are uh, uh, through observations made by the uh, profession. So um, the American geriatric uh, uh, society actually has uh, come up with uh, six key features that can be used uh, while uh, assessing pain in patients who are elderly and unable to communicate. So this again includes facial expression, body movements, uh, change in interpersonal relationship, uh, changes in activity or routines of the patient. Uh, if the patient is um, uh, daily taking a bath, uh, or uh, uh, taking food, uh, suppose they are refusing food, that is an indication that they have something. So all this has been, uh, so it is mainly through behavioral um, observation that uh, we assess pain in patients with uh, who are unable to communicate. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for the, uh, the, so the, is, but the problem in this particular patient was, he was already diagnosed as having dementia, Parkinson's, so all because of this degenerative process in the brain. So. Uh, you know, none attributed that to the pain. <laughs> that was the problem in this particular case. That's why the pain ad and, uh, uh, you know, the behavioral pain scales help in geriatrics and not just patients with Parkinson's or degenerative processes. Any patient above the age of 75, 80, when they have pain, it manifests as behavioral changes, as Dr. Sunil rightly said. So any patient who come, comes with an acute confusional state may actually will be the first sign of severe pain and so we need to approach that. So the pain ad is a simple tool. It's available, the Dolo Plus tool. So these are dementia specific and there are geriatric pain scales, as he rightly said. So you can use these. So different populations, you have specialized pain tools. So something, uh, why I prefer the CPOT is because it's universal. It's, you can generalize it for a huge list in your hospital, in your area for even patients who are out of the critical care unit, in the critical care unit. So it's easier to use. But yes, uh, for dementia, there are specific scales. Yeah. Uh, so I think um, uh, we have to wind up the session. Uh, so uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Mahesh Menon, um, for a very simple and a very clear presentation uh, on uh, difficult pain and um, uh, for your uh, inputs uh, into the case presentation. So thank you very much um, to find out uh, some time for us uh, from your DC schedule. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, Dr. Bijo, uh, for uh, coming up with a patient story, uh, which actually can make uh, much difference in the practice of many of us, um, especially in pain management. Uh, you touched upon pain management, delirium, and many other things. So thank you, uh, Dr. Bijo, and thank you all for your active participation. So once again, thank you, Dr. Mahesh. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for this option. Thanks. Take Thank care. you everyone for joining us. And I'm extremely sorry, Dr. Mahesh, because I had to be like <laughs> torturing you with my messages to join, uh, even though I knew that you were very busy with your schedule. And I do know that you have just jumped into this session from your schedule just after your round. So and still you found out so much time for this wonderful cohort. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for making all the sessions interactive. So Thank with you. that don't uh, and I promise that we'll be meeting again with another interactive session and an eminent faculty. This is Sri Priya along with Dr. Mahesh Menon and Dr. Sunil Kumar signing off from the Tipsy Kuhab.
Everyone take care. Be safe. Thank you, Dr. Biju. Thanks, team.